three, four, five. There are five kinds of churches. Subtraction, plateau, addition, reproducing, multiplication. The first type of church is the church of subtraction. Every Sunday, the church gets smaller. Scarcity is king, and the congregation slowly disperses into the wind. The second type is the church of plateau. Most churches in the world live here. Opportunity surrounds them, but they remain unchanged. Their light contained, neither growing nor shrinking. The third state of churches is the state of addition. Constantly on the run from plateau, this church grows, little by little, adding one by one by one. The growth is good, but it is slow. Occasionally, the third type of church transforms into a fourth type. Instead of adding one more person, it reproduces, becoming two churches. Then it reproduces again. The ripples of this church spread throughout the world. But there is a fifth type of church. A multiplying church, a church to mirror the book of Acts, a church without limits, a church like it was always intended to be, a church on the move. Five. All right. So of those five, which church do you think the American church represents there? Did you catch it? We're going to come back to that, okay? So I want you to hold that in your mind. As we study what God's Word says about His church, I came across an incredible headline. It was a secular London newspaper, and it offered a prize for an essay. And this was their question. What's wrong with the church? Okay? I don't know if I'm offended by the question or if I'm just glad that a secular paper even recognized there is a church. What's wrong with the church? They gave an award to the best essay writer. And the award, believe it or not, actually went to a minister. He lived in Wales, and this was his answer. I love it. It says, what's wrong with the church is our failure to realize and wonder at the beauty, the mystery, the glory, and the greatness of the church. Ooh, I love that. I love that because Jesus loves that. Jesus loves his church. He loves his church so much he gave his life to establish it, to redeem it. He is coming back for his church. It is his bride. It is called the bride of Christ. It's the bride of Christ for a reason. And I came across a great meme this week about how, how men feel when they get called the bride of Christ. I just want you to know, guys, it is nothing like that, okay, at all. That is not what we're talking about. So you can relax on that. As the worldwide church, thankfully, finally seems to be opening back up and resuming its mission. I'm reminded of the early church, what we just saw in that short video, the church in Acts, the original church, Acts 1, Acts 2. In fact, that's where we're going to be today. You want to go ahead and pull up your Bible or open up your favorite app? We're going to be in Acts chapter 1 and kind of hold your place there because I want to set the context for what this is really going on, what, what's happening here. At this point, Jesus has already been crucified. He's already been buried in the tomb. He's already been resurrected back to life, and he's still here. Now he has got all his suffering behind him, and he's back meeting with his disciples. So it is a crazy, chaotic, beautiful, incredibly exciting time for sure. And that's where we pick up the story. Look at verse 3 of Acts chapter 1. He says this, After he, that's Jesus, had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Wait, what? Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you've heard me speak about it, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, 
Is it now? Are you restoring the kingdom of Israel right now at this time? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up as they were watching. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, they were gazing up into heaven. And suddenly, two men in white clothes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will also come the same way you have seen him going into heaven. Wow, there it is, y'all. He is leaving us the mandate. Last week I talked about this and I called the church indestructible. Remember that? The church is indestructible, despite the fact that it is made up of gloriously flawed people like us, because we serve a flawless God, a God who is in control, who has given us a mandate. And if you know the Lord, then you have been transformed and we now have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. But as I look back over the last years, even a few decades at the church in America and around the world, I wonder if some of the church doesn't believe this. I wonder if some of the church has forgotten its power, almost like a toothless tiger. I look around, I see, see, hurricane season, as much as we dread it, is actually starting next week. Can you believe that? Hurricane season, it'll run through November, and I remember a huge hurricane that hit South Florida. I was reading this story about a sweet old lady named Miss Norena, and her home was devastated. The damage was incredible. The good news was, insurance guy came out, wrote a big check, and the work with a new contractor began to go, and then the bad news is, when the money ran out, so did the contractors. They left, and they left her in a home with no electricity, no power. Now we think, oh man, how could you do that? Well, come to find out, Miss Norena has been living in that house without power ever since the hurricane hit. Now, if you're like me, you think, oh, I wonder which hurricane that was. This is, this is the heartbreaking part. We're talking about the big one, okay? And I'm not even talking about going way back to Katrina. I'm talking, go back to 1992, Hurricane Andrew. She has been living in South Florida in the dark, in an unfinished house since 1992. No heat when the winter chill comes, and it does come to Florida. No hot water for showers. No air conditioning in the summer. Are you kidding? I've got three fans on me right now. She endured this in silence, getting by with a battery-powered lamp and one single propane burner stove. That was it. You know what was heartbreaking? Not one of her neighbors even noticed. For almost 30 years, Miss Norena lived without power, the total absence of power, and no one even seemed to notice. So finally, a tip was given to the mayor. The mayor came, checked on her, and saw the condition she was living in. And within a matter of two hours, they had a contractor there and restored the power. The contractor was able to come and give electricity. Check out, when she was interviewed, check out her response. She says, it's almost hard to describe what it's like having power switched back on. It is literally overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, I bet it is. You got air conditioning. You got power. Think about this. How many people do we know have been living their entire lives without ever knowing what it was like to have the overwhelming power of the Holy Spirit. Honestly, I look around, I think there are some churches right now that have had the power turned off for so long, they wouldn't even recognize it if it came back on. Now, that is an indictment. But the good news is, because you know I got the good news, it doesn't have to be that way. As Jesus ascended, he left his church. He said, you will be filled with authority. You will be filled with power. We just read it. Before Jesus left this earth and returned to heaven, he gave us this promise. He says, you will receive power. You will receive what? Say it with me power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be telling everybody about me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. Now, here's what we forget. This promise wasn't just given to the disciples then. This was given to the church, to the mandate that we are supposed to carry and give from generation to generation. So, you know, I got to ask, 
Don't hate me. How you doing with that? How are we doing as a church, little c, and as a church, big c, as we think of the worldwide church? Jesus gave us three truths that we're supposed to know about. The first one is this. The power must be first received. The power has to be received, okay? So if you're new to the faith, maybe you're joining us online and you stumbled upon us. You don't understand this whole Christianity thing. Man, I get it. This sounds kind of weird. How do we do that? How do we have this life of power? We love to complicate this, but thankfully, the very next chapter, check out what Peter says. Peter summarizes it. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus to show that you have received forgiveness of your sin. There it is. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you and to your children and even to Auburn fans. A true story. Even to the Gentiles. Can you believe that? Sorry, buddy. Even to Duke fans. Even to Carolina Tar Heel fans. It's to everybody. That's what Gentiles means. It means everybody, who, people who are not like you. It is to everybody. This is what it's supposed to be, to all who have been called. God wants none to perish and all to come to repentance. See, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself. And if you have repented of your sins and confessed him as Lord, and you agree with God that he has been raised from the dead, you've received the Lord Jesus' forgiveness, then based on the word of God, you are a new creation. And the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within you. That is the guarantee. When he comes back, he knows what he's looking for. Because the Holy Spirit has taken up residence. He is your comforter. He is your guide. He is your companion. Now notice this promise is for every succeeding generation. Don't miss that. So every one of us must repent and be baptized. Have you done that? Maybe you're like me and you'd repented of your sins, but you never took that next step. You were never baptized. You know, like me, I was, I was an older teenager when I finally realized it because you know, it was a decision. Maybe you were baptized like an infant, like me, and your parents made the decision. You know, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say be baptized and when you're older, repent. It says repent. That's your decision, your call to follow Christ. And then be baptized. That is your first step to identify with the church. So if that's you, or maybe you were younger and you don't really remember it, we can take care of that. Many people are baptized as adults. There's nothing wrong with that. Pastor Steve, who co-founded this church years ago, said, if I could, I would be baptized every single Sunday just to show the devil whose side I'm on and whose side I'm not. So if you haven't done that, we're going to be baptizing again just in a couple weeks. After church, will you just come up and tell me? If you're watching online, just send me an email. I would love to walk with you through this. It is such a beautiful, profoundly simple ordinance, but it is so important. So if you're a Christian today, you've repented of your sins, you've been baptized, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have the power within, okay? It's the power of God given by God to accomplish the things of God. The next thing we're supposed to do is have the power applied. And this is where we drop the ball, right here. See, it's one thing to realize we have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's another to actually apply that power. Think about the sweet lady we just talked about, Miss Norena. She has her power cut off. She has the electricity turned back on. We get that. But what if all those years, what if an electrician snuck out to her house and under the cover of darkness turned on the power and crept away? and never told her. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how bizarre that would be? She wouldn't know. She'd go on living just as if she had no power. She would go through life just saying, oh, I want to see. She has to go up. No one bothered to tell her, but she, all she had to do was flip that switch. All she had to do was do that. But until she knew that, until she did it, the electricity being there would have done her zero good. Some of you see where I'm going with this. It is the same with the Holy Spirit. We're all promised this. We're all empowered by it. But until we actually step out and we use that and we walk in that power and that authority, we will continue to live and look like we have no power at all. And we all know people like that. Jesus is speaking to his early disciples. He specifically tells them, I will give you new power and you are to take that and tell everyone everywhere about me. We're supposed to share that, that experience that we've had ourselves, we're supposed to share with others. And I'm going to share at the end of today an awesome way that we are all going to be able to do that because God wants to use you. Hear me. God wants to use every single person, even if you think you don't have something to give, even if you think you're too young or you're too old, God can use you as his vessel to advance the kingdom. All right. If you don't think so, check this out. I read just this week about Pastor Steve Yeschik. He's a pastor of a church in Illinois. 
Pastor Steve recently lost his sister, Judy Yeschik. Judy had just finished a horrible five-year battle with cancer. It was brutal. And Pastor Steve, her brother, described her in, in, in words saying she was beautiful, but she was the stereotypical, rebellious, wild sister. She was, she never missed a party, and it got out of control, and as her life continued to go, it would spiral, and she was an out-of-control drinker, and she was just living kind of a very self-centered, borderline destructive lifestyle. And every time Pastor Steve would talk to her to try to share Jesus, she would just laugh it off and say, I've got time. Don't worry about it. You just worry about yourself. And everybody still loved her. She exuded such an excitement, such a zest for life. But at the age of 44, the laughter stopped. Because that's when her world caved in, when she found out she had that diagnosis of aggressive cancer. When she came home, she learned not only that, but her husband also was diagnosed with aggressive cancer. Here was the difference. Her husband says, you're going to walk this battle alone, and he leaves has another family, another wife, a whole other life. And she now has to walk this horrible road by herself. Okay? So it's in that context that she starts to reach out to her brother, pastor, and say, tell me more about Jesus. I'm starting to think a little bit more, uh, do some soul searching, and think these eternal questions are starting to, to need answers. Finally, within a few hours of hearing the gospel, her walls came down and she received the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that moment to the end of her life, Jesus and her church became the priority. She began to share this new life with everyone. It became her greatest aim to win people to the Lord, sharing boldly everywhere. Even though she was undergoing painful surgery after painful surgery and getting worse, while all the time praying for a miraculous healing, what she came to understand was the greater miracle was that she could reach friends and family that she'd never been able to reach before. Even as she struggled for her last breaths, she talked her way out of the hospital so that she could be baptized. She didn't talk it out to go to a party. She didn't talk it out to go live it up or go do one last hurrah. She talked, it, uh, talked her way out of the hospital so she could publicly proclaim, I am all in. Jesus is the way to the Father. So at this baptism service, Judy invited everyone she knew that she had run with to come to this baptism service. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, she shared her testimony urgently because she just had days to live. Her 84-year-old father was the first to repent and come to faith in Christ. Her 84-year-old father. Then her nieces accepted Christ that night. Then her college roommate, who was her drinking buddy. Then a new age cultist, her aunt, her sister, several others. And then the doors open at the back and her dying ex-husband comes down and says, what must I do to be saved? That is power. People started to get saved, and it was incredible. Even after she died just 10 days later, her testimony lived on. She had prepared her own funeral service and gave a note to her brother, Pastor Steve, and said, would you read this at my funeral? He got up and read this. She was still being used by God. Over 100 people prayed to receive Christ at her funeral. How? She was just a typical, stereotypical person who was ordinary in every way, but she was willing to be used by God. She was that focused. So a question for us today is, what about us? See, when Jesus is telling the disciples, you need to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth, what is he talking about? We don't have that. Well, he was saying, this affects everybody. This affects your hometown, Jerusalem. Judea, that's your state. Samaria, that's bigger. There's your country. To the ends of the earth, that is the whole world. And this is where you and I come in. Are we willing to be the spokesmen and women for Christ? Like Judy Eschick was, to make ourselves available. That was your challenge last week, to pray, God, am I available? Can you use me? See, when we do that, then we will see the last thing. The power will be transferred. This is the beautiful part. If you look at church history, you will see the gospel message started in Jerusalem, it spread to Judea, then Samaria to the ends of the earth. Jesus made a promise, and they acted on that promise. Ooh, now it's getting real. We are here today as a result of their obedience. Did you catch that? The generations, we're supposed to hand this to the next generation of believers until Jesus returns for us. This is where the modern church is dropping the ball. Here is the big question for each of us. Who are we going to transfer the power to? 
Who are we going to transfer the authority to? If we're one generation away from extinction, where's our Jerusalem? Where's our Judea? Where's our Samaria? Thankfully, the ends of the earth, we have a fantastic missions team. Pastor Bill and Diane leading the God. I hope you all take one of those cards today. I'd love to see that empty today. We have that. What about our own backyard? And this is where it gets exciting, because I don't want to be guilty of spiritual selfishness, where I'm willing to receive the good news, and I'm willing to hear it and change myself, but I'm unwilling to share that with anyone else. All we have to do is take the next step. So here's what we're going to do. You remember when you saw the video a few minutes ago? Last week, I shared with you that not long ago, five or six years ago, we were in the number one category. It was, it was bleak. You, shared, you heard that. If not, make sure you catch that because I shared the whole story, how it was a very dire time. We were able to climb our way to number two, right? Growing just enough that we were fending off death and dying, you know, keeping up with the population plateaued. Did you catch what he said? How many churches are in number one and number two? Okay. I actually dug deeper and found the statistics. Are you ready for this? These are heartbreaking statistics. 80% of the church in America is either a number one or number two category. 80% are either plateaued or dying. 80%. Flatline. If you ever see an EKG, you don't see the heartbeat going up, you see a flatline, what does that tell you? Yeah. It's dead, right? It's dying. This is, this is incredible to me. So in recent months, we have been so blessed. We've had a very healthy trajectory, COVID notwithstanding, and we were transitioning to the third group, which is addition. And that's awesome. Steady growth. But if you know what the Lord wants, that all come to repentance, it's not nearly enough. In fact, to all my pastors who are watching, all my friends, all those people who heard me speak at the statewide convention, hear me. The status quo, the same old, same old, me focus, myopic vision isn't cutting it. So the guru of church health, Dave Ferguson, and all his awesome team at the boards, they, they went out, they, they led the exponential and all the TED Talks that you've seen for great leadership. He took his team of experts, and he very quietly evaluated thousands of churches across the country. And they wanted to see exactly where the modern church was in America. And the results were stunning. You all know me, I'm not a big numbers nerd, but even I cannot ignore these, okay? What was stunning, obviously, was that 80% of the churches today fell in the one or the two category. 80%. Only 14% ended up being in the middle, number three. 14%. Okay? We think that that's, wow, and that's where we are. Only 14 do that. Let that sink in because the next number is what hit me. Only a minuscule 6% of churches in America were considered a level four church, a reproducing church. Did y'all catch what you, did you add that up? Do you know what that means? When you look at number five, the team of experts could not find a single church in America that was an Acts chapter two multiplying church. Not one. What are we doing? Not one. The closest they found was this great church in Hawaii that's beginning to have churches that reproduce churches. And we see that happening. We're not talking about planting other campuses. That's totally different. What this showed me, as we draw closer to the Lord's return with every generation, something must change. And that's where the good news comes in. What if there was a different way? Going back to the book of Acts, what if like-minded churches and pastors came together to do something bold, something empowered by the Holy Spirit to help each other truly become a level five multiplying church? Because hear me, during these dark times, when you see the great falling away that was prophesied, you also read that there is a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the same time. The church of the Lord Jesus is alive, it is breathing, it is living, and as such, it is meant to live and grow and reproduce, all right? Just like healthy trees are supposed to bear fruit, and just like healthy marriages are supposed to be able to bear children, healthy churches should be bearing fruit and producing children as well. So let me share with you what we learned at the convention. Okay, this is a quick state of the church in America. Just simply by the numbers, you math people will love this, okay? What we saw for the last couple decades, we are seeing roughly 4,000 churches dying every year. 4,000 churches closing 
every year. Now think about that. That means we have to be planting 4,000 churches every year just to stay flatlined with reaching people for the gospel. That's not increasing. That's not taking enemy territory. That's holding status quo. 4,000. Think about that. All right. Now, if there's roughly 314,000 congregations in 2010, and the population was 309 million, that is roughly a ratio of one church for every 1,000 people in our country. Think about that. You know what's scary about that? Most churches reach between 20 and 50 people, not 1,000. We think, oh, that's a great ratio until you hear that. You think, if most churches averaged between 20 and 50 people that they've reached, just to keep that ratio of one for every 1,000, when the population hits 400 million, see, in 2050, that's what they estimate, we would need minimum 400,000 churches just to keep the ratio of one to 1,000. All right, now I want you to think about that. Do you know what that means? That means we have to be planting 86,000 new churches. That's 6,100 churches every single year, and that's not getting ahead. That blew my mind. That's just maintaining status quo. And the brutal reality is the status quo isn't enough. It's playing defense. And we are not called to play defense with the gospel. We have to play offense and take ground away from the devil. So what do we do? <laughs> we join the battle. We join the battle. We go from being a cul-de-sac-minded church like America to being a conduit. We go from not thinking about it as a lake with no output. We go to being a mighty, life-giving river, as the Scripture tells us to be, the biblical model. This is such an exciting time in the life, not only of this church, but the church, because God is pouring out His Spirit, and I don't want to miss a single blessing. See, the goal has never will never, should never be to get more people into my building. The goal is not to get people into my church. The goal is to see people come into his church. Do we catch that? It's not about us right here. If, that, if it's about us, our vision is too small. No wonder we have the status quo. No wonder we are seeing people being born and die without knowing Jesus faster than we can tell them. See, our vision shouldn't be about our seating capacity. Our vision should be about our sending capacity. In addition to these incredible efforts that we see in Ghana with the ends of the earth, what if we did our part right here in North Carolina, our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, right here in our backyard? So here's what we're going to do. And this is bold. Some of you are going to get this right away and you're going to go, oh my goodness, that's audacious. Some of you are going to say, I don't know what that means. And that's okay because we will walk this road together. We are going to help plant and launch five churches in the next five years. Five churches in the next five years or sooner. Think about this. Others of you, when you see this, the exciting part about these new churches is just this. They are excited. They are on fire. Because of that, new churches reach more people for Christ than established churches. Did you know that? New churches have a window. They are proven to reach more people for Jesus than any other time in the history of their church in the first five years. Now do you see the urgency? Now do you see the excitement behind planting new churches for the kingdom? Remember, our goal is not simply to fill a building for an hour. That is not the, that is, you don't see that in the New Testament. It's not about advancing my kingdom. The goal is for pastors and, and Christians and disciples to be team Jesus. Not team Potter's Hand, not team Hope, not team Summit. Here's what, here's what, if it's about us, then our mission is too small. The devil has already won. We have to think bigger. So what does that mean? Here's the deal. We want to see not only the churches we send, not only the churches we plant, I want to see the churches they plant. Did you catch that? I'm excited to see our children. Don't get me wrong. That's awesome. But I really, really want to see our children have children. I want to know our grandchildren. I want to see them and see them doing the New Testament multiplication, healthy churches, planting healthy churches, reaching out because it's not cutting it. One-on-one -on -one addition is not even biblical. We have got to be freeing people up. Go tell somebody about Jesus. You go. Some of you in this room are about to be put on mission and you don't even know it. Some of you may be called into the ministry and you haven't even been called yet. Some of you are going to have a chance to serve right here. Some of you I'm actually going to send somewhere else. What? Yeah, it's okay. 
A pastor once said, he said, oh, but, you know, what if they need a band? What if we plant a church? And they, you know, are you going you gonna to send a couple of musicians? Are you going to send a band? No, no. We would be willing to send our A band. That's how we want to be. We want to be committed to that. We want to set them up to succeed. We want to set them up. See, when we plant five new churches this year, the first one is already rolling. Did you know that? I've already met the pastor. He's here. You will meet him in a couple weeks, Lord willing. That city is not far from here. Let me show you how this will work. And we're going to share much of this in the weeks to come, okay? But I just want to give you a little bit. All they need is a mom and dad church. They're ready. They're fired up. They've even got most of their funding. Okay, this isn't even about money. They need people to come beside them so they don't go through what we went through as an orphan. It was so hard. There is such a better way. What if there is a coalition of churches who come together and link arms? Because there is a movement. In fact, it's called the Carolina Movement. And people are talking about this now. It is being talked about all across the country where we come together and we say, listen, we're going to take a trip to your neighboring city and we're going to help plant. We're going to go hang door knockers. We're going to go wear your t-shirts. We're going to attend your launch. We're going to have your flags out. We're going to be there. Our pastor will preach in your point. You'll come preach over here. We will be a brother and sister. We will link arms for three years. We will help sustain you. And then we will turn you loose and help you do it to somebody else and give the ministry away. Some of these graduates and stuff, people keep, it kills me when they say, oh, they're the future of the church. No, they're not. They're the church now. The only reason they can't get up is because we're in the way. We have got to give them away. They say, oh, you got to use your A team because that B team, the B team is the A team. They're just being set on the bench. Do you see this? You are the A team. We can do this together. Some of you will be able to make a missions trip to neighboring cities. I'll send you out. Some of you may never come back. That's okay, because it's not about me. It's not about this church. It's about the church. Time is short. We've got to tell people about him. Some of you can do exciting things right here from your chair. I'm going to walk you through some of those in the coming weeks. Some of you may feel led to help invest financially. I already talked to one person. They said, this has got to cost a fortune. I mean, isn't, we just now got financially stable ourselves. How can we do that? What if I told you because of the coalition sharing the load, that we can plant each of these churches for less than 650 bucks a month. And that covers the staff, and it's unbelievable. Y'all, there are small groups that can underwrite that today. They're into, think about that. This is unbelievable. We don't have any excuse when we stand before the Lord. We cannot afford to say, the gospel's good for me, but not for thee. We got it, we not. Look, our building's packed, it's awesome. Smells good. New carpet looks awesome. We've never been healthier. I love it. That's awesome. We're not moving the ball. The ball is still stuck at the 20-yard line. We have got to step forward. There is a movement happening, okay? So people are talking about this, and it is amazing what happens when people link arms for the gospel, and you don't care who gets the credit. So here's what we're going to do, okay? I see my time's just about out, so we're going to end different. I'm going to issue your challenge, and then we're going to stand. I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to dismiss we're going to do something different. While the music's playing, I want you, if you are all in and you're interested in taking the next step and following out and saying, you know what, I'm a disciple that's all in and you're fired up. If you are ready to take ground from the enemy, on your way out, will you just walk by after you take a card, after you congratulate the graduates, will you just walk by and just give me a high five or a pound or a thumbs up from a distance or a wink at me, blow me a kiss, something, just to let me know, Pastor, I see the vision. I'm all in. We've got to go. We have got to go. The status quo is not cutting it. It is time for kingdom-minded people to go on offense. I just need to know who's with me. All right, let's stand together. I'm going to pray for you. Afterwards, please go get a card. Come by, give me a high five. Let me know that you're in, and we will start plugging people in, and I'll share more of this vision as we go. All right, let's pray together. God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the mandate that you've given us. It is such a staggering staggering wave that we see, but you are in control. And I thank you for passion. I thank you for these like-minded brothers and sisters who, again, could be anywhere today, and they chose to be in your house ready to accept the mission. God, would you equip us? Holy Spirit, it is your power that makes all things possible. We don't want to do this in the flesh. We want to come alongside that you've already called all these pastors that are in waiting that just need a mom and a dad to believe in them. Here am I, Lord. Send us. Help us to equip. We don't want to be known as a seeding church. We want to be known as a sending church. So God, we're not waiting for others. We're saying, use us. 
we are available. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our graduates today, on every person that you have a territory for us to stake that claim. God, give us the authority, the boldness, the power, the ability to be willing to do that. We trust you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.